good evening. I am going to call to order this uh, work session of the Mayor and Council for May 26, 2020. And before we get started, I've just noticed that, that I do have Wi-Fi but no internet. Okay, so Jim, can you work on that? We, I have Wi-Fi and no internet. I think the same for probably everybody. I have, apparently have no internet. I'm, okay. I'm going to the website. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, first item on the agenda tonight is, um, for the work session, is governing body, number one, election of GMA District 4 officers. We do this every year. It's a formality. Um, so if there are no questions, I would recommend that we place this item on the consent agenda. No objection. Without objection, I'll place that item on the consent agenda. We'll now move on to item B1, Public Works, Bobby Elliott, Recreation Center, uh, Senior Center HVAC Replacement, Nick Griffin, presenting. Good evening. This item is to replace a 25-ton unit that's currently in the Senior Center or located in the Senior Center uh, at the Recreation Department. Um, I'm sure you guys have read it, but it's 28 years old. It's an R22 system. It's incredibly old. We've had multiple issues over the past couple of years about it tripping the breaker, uh, blowing, blowing certain electrical parts because it's pulling too much power because it is an older motor that, that powers this unit. Um, it is a budgeted item. Last year we budgeted 49647 um, or we budgeted 49302 I've reached out to multiple HVAC companies that were local um, and also some that were that spaced out of, out of Atlanta and I only had two interested companies bid on this project and the other two that we'll speak about here in a minute. Um, I based the budgeting numbers last year uh, off Action Electric. This company we use for all, pretty much all of our HVAC needs as far as services and um, repair calls and things like that. Uh, but they, they were over, over $10,000 more expensive than this other company. I've, I've met with KBS, I've met with one of the co-owners, very confident in a relationship that we can probably proceed with. Um, they do a lot of work that are local, especially in Douglas County, and I've included a little bit of their, um, a little bit of that information as well, uh, if you'd like to read about them. So the city is asking that the council allows us to hire KBS Heating and Cooling um, to install a 25-ton unit in the senior center. Okay, council, do you have any questions? I still don't have the backup because I don't have internet. Does anybody have any questions for Nick? No, but I, I think this does point out it's good to go out for bids occasionally and find out that you're being overcharged. So yes, sir. Appreciate that. Yes, sir. And and actually, I'm extremely happy. We call them they're they're a huge a huge company, so we get response. You most of the time within three to four hours, we can have a technician out there, and that is one benefit of going with a larger company. They may be a little bit more expensive. Now I know how, how much more expensive, um, but their response time is incredible and it always has been. It's a company that will be around for many, many years. This company is not going anywhere, so their warranties, they can always stand up to. Um, but yes, I, I can't justify a $10,000 uh, overage as far as quotes go. And I'm excited about the relationship that we could build with KBS. Okay, uh, council, anyone have any other questions? Okay, there are no other questions. I will uh, place this item on the consent agenda if there are no objections. No objections. No objections. Okay, let's go ahead and move on to item B2, Nick. Uh, two dehumidification systems for the library. And if you would, just give just a little bit of background on that because, one, it's a significant issue, and two, we haven't heard about it in a little while. So we don't really know the the ongoing condition of the of the humidity in that library. Yes, sir. The, the status hasn't quite changed uh, from last I was spoke. I spoke to you guys about it in the budget prep sessions. Um, I think you all are aware that we are having humid humidity issues at the library due to what I believe and other um, employees at the city believe is water intrusion from window seals. 
Um, I, I have proven this. I just am not 100% confident that that is our only area of issue. Um, there has been multiple windows that we've had. We've hired contractors to come in and replace the seals. Um, we've replaced a couple of seals and also sealed up some of these windows that we could visually see the leaking. And it was, there was a good bit of water intrusion. It was all, it's always been a little damp there, um, especially before we put the portable humidifiers in there. And I mean, those are proving to work because we're having to dump out the five gallon buckets of water they're pulling from the air. A little bit of humidity is, you can't avoid humidity and a regular HVAC system is in itself a dehumidifier if you really break down the heating and cooling processes it's taking you know, heat from the air, it's pulling the moisture in, from the condensing unit, and it's going through an evaporator and it's evaporating this moisture. It's just these specific units, they have a, a whole system that super cools the air before it reaches the actual um, evaporator. And so it's super cooling it, pulling out a lot more moisture than just a regular HVAC system. Um, it is a little bit more expensive, but not as much as I really imagine these systems to be. I think they will do a great job uh, dehumidifying a lot better than these portable units. Um, one of the biggest perks uh, in this project, if we proceed with it, is that we'll have two working functional units that we can repurpose for different facilities. Since we are under budget, you know, 4,500 bucks and 10 grand here and 10 grand on the next one, we'll have close to $25,000 that we can use these units that we're pulling off the roof and we can put them at different facilities. You know, one in mind has a 15 ton unit that's broken right now. So um, we could use that money that we're saving here, still use the units we're pulling off and, and add these dehumidification units as well. Um, so I think it's really a really good idea and project to proceed with. As far as long-term goals, eventually, I mean, not eventually, but as soon as we can, we need to start addressing the other issues that are present. It's beyond my expertise. We'll have to hire an expert. So you're, so we've talked about this. Uh, we talked about it last year. And you're confident that these two dehumidification systems will do the work that's already being done with the smaller units, but it will be doing it on its own. It'll pump this water out of the facility without having to empty buckets. Is that correct? That's correct. And, and more. I think okay. they'll do way and, I, and there's no question that this is needed. Council, does anyone have any questions? Somebody turn there. Oh, it's <laughs> same old culprit. <laughs> <laughs> Council members, anybody have any questions? The only question I had, I think you more or less answered, because what I remembered from the budget meeting was it was suspected that there was a problem with the ceiling around the windows. And from what I heard you say, correct me if I'm wrong, you guys have addressed a number of those but it's probably not the only problem. We've addressed a number of them on ground level, especially okay. this, like the children's area in the manager's office or the director's mm -hmm. office. There's been, you know, visual intrusion. Uh, we've corrected those, and that was actually a cantilevered shelf that was inset into the brick that didn't have good sealant. Um, so there could be different types of issues that I can't fix. It's beyond my skill level. Um, but we have addressed all that we could. Okay. That was my only question. I'd written that down because I remembered that from budget time and you referenced it. So, yes, okay, thanks, Nick. Yes, ma'am. Is uh, KBS able to do an audit of the building to find other intrusion points of moisture? KBS probably would not be the company that I would recommend coming in and doing that. We would need more of like a structural engineer. Um, and I'm sure there are other specialty, you know, professions that could come in and do a little bit better of a job than KBS. You know, they're mainly dealing with the duct work, and I really don't think we're having any issues of the, the curbs or the units that are on the roof. Um, there, in fact, could be, but if we were going to pay a company to do it, I would really like a company that specializes in possible water intrusion or uh, infrastructure fails as far as a building goes. Okay. Any other questions from the council? So this is a needed uh, improvement to the library system and, and while I think there is a lot more to be done over there uh, that doesn't give us any reason not to do this so I would recommend this onto the consent agenda if there are no objections no objection no objection 
Okay, Nick, let's move on to item number four, purchase SLG R2632 scissor lift. Go ahead. Uh, there was one item number three. It was three. Yeah. Police yeah. Oh, <laughs> go ahead with number three then. They don't get air conditioning. No. <laughs> Just kidding, but Chief. They are getting it now, but it's not quite adequate and probably won't last the next year or two. Councilwoman McPherson had told me that she didn't really want these new air conditioning <laughs> units in here, so I tried to skip it. Just kidding. <laughs> Just kidding. Go ahead. Uh, these are to replace three existing gas furnaces and AC units um, behind the PD. These mainly cool, heat and cool uh, the police department. Uh, the current units right now, they're they're over 15 years old, and again, they're on an R22 type coolant or refrigerant. Once these units have a leak or anything like that, it gets very costly to repair just because they're not manufacturing R22 refrigerant anymore. It's close to anywhere from $100 a pound up to $500 a pound from what I experienced, and that fluctuates. So there's no definitive price that it's going to stay at, but we are going to run out of it eventually. Um, that could be in 10, 20 years, but it's really expensive to repair, and these units are old, so they're not going to last forever. We're also under budget with this one um, by $10,633, uh, $63, I'm sorry, uh, with KBS coming in at the low bid. How many bids did you get on these, Nick? Because I'm noticing that you have these same two. One of, two of these items are $10,000 apart, and one of them is $5,000 apart. Did you get three bids? I was, I was unable to. I actually have reached out to at least five different companies, four of which were local, very local, within a couple cities. And um, I, I had another company come out and meet me, and they turned down the work. They said it's a little bit beyond our scope. Um, they, they're doing a lot of apartment builds and new builds. Construction is going crazy right now. So some of these local companies, are they don't have time to do big projects okay. or the I, equipment. I would just say that, and I understand that, but I would like to see at least three bids as often as we can get them. I heard you say that you tried to get that. This is These gaps of $10,000 just seem like a lot. It's 25% of these particular bids. Um, so, okay, council, does anyone have any questions? Okay, if there are no questions... I would uh, recommend this one for the consent agenda as well. Are there any objections? No objection. All right. Now we'll do the scissor lift. Um, okay. So this is to purchase the scissor lift. It is also budgeted. Um, originally, we budgeted for a scissor lift at last year's prices along with a, a really hefty trailer. Um, I was able to get three bids on this lift. Um, our local company, Herc Rental, well, they're not quite local. They're down 78 in Douglas County. Um, they came in at the low bid at $14,805. The scissor lift kind of justifies itself for the, the amount of need that the city requires to have a lift like this. Um, well, it'll end up paying for itself if, if we have our own versus renting one anytime we have an event or a, a repair that's needed that is too tall for an A-frame ladder, things like that. Um, so it is, it is a great price in my opinion. Um. Okay, are there any questions from council? Why did we decide scissor lift? Was a boom lift not practical? No, sir, it's not. I, I wouldn't prefer a boom lift over a scissor lift simply because a, one man can operate a scissor lift. As far as boom lift goes, it's not. I don't like booming. A lot of people don't like booming out quite that much, and it's this one is more maneuverable. Say if I needed to get on the amphitheater, I could boom from the front of it, but with the scissor lift, I can drive up that ramp, get to the back, get wherever I need, and I can move while I'm on it. It works well in tight spaces, and it can actually fit this tight. This scissor lift can fit through pretty much any door we have in the city. So say for some reason I needed to get into the city hall, I could actually take it into city hall. It'll fit right through that door. Um, so it's very, very multi-purpose. Okay. Uh, if there are no objections, we'll place this on the consent agenda. No objection. No objection. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. Okay, we're going to move on to uh, C, utilities. Number one, uh, replacement of high service pump drive three, Pete Zerbanis. Good afternoon, Mayor Council. Afternoon. Uh, this is actually an uh, emergency replacement. Uh, for the number three high service pump drive that failed. Um, 
we were very fortunate in the fact that uh, we had PRB, who's local to us and does a lot of work for us, um, that they had a, a Yaskawa drive on the shelf that we could uh, install um, to uh, expedite this repair. Uh, staff recommends the approval for the replacement and installation of the number three high service pump drive to PRB Electronics Incorporated in an amount not to exceed $11,770.65. Okay, council members, does anybody have any questions? Uh, has this work already been done or is this something we still have to do? Pardon me? Have you already done this We've work? We've already done it, yes. Okay. This, this is, is a just... critical pump. We had to get it fixed right away. Right. And this was a budgeted item. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, if there are no objections, I'll place this item on the consent agenda. No objection. All right, Pete, let's move on to number two, Keckenwood Booster Pump Station proposal. Okay, this is a request for engineering services by Keckenwood Engineering for upgrades to the Connors Road Booster Pump Station. And uh, they would provide engineering design and preparation of construction drawings and specifications for the booster pump station upgrades. Um, the, the need for this arises from the fact that uh, when the booster pump station was installed around between 2004, 2005, um, the design of the station was to meet the immediate demand that was going on at the time with, with the boom and all the construction starts that were happening then. Um, and so the pumps were designed to pressurize the system, boost water into the system from Douglas County. Uh, basically, it drafts off the Andy Mountain tank that they have in Douglas County. Um, however, over the booster pump station that had been uh, mothballed for about 12 years and had not been operational. A lot of things were not working properly. Um, a lot of things have changed since 2005 uh, in the area with the demands. And so I think Pete, it's- Pete, just orient yes, me to where that booster station is. It's on Connors Road. Help me get to where it is. It's right across from the daycare center. Or the school right kids up. university at the at the entrance to Mirror Lake Parkway. Yes. O okay. Is it right just, there in the corner? To, yes. Okay. All right. I know. Go ahead. Okay. So I think it's important now to uh, number one, it's prudent that we have an additional backup uh, and a viable one with Douglas County, uh, similar to the one that we have with Carroll County Water Authority. Um, but we need to take a look at what the demand is. Uh, also, the purpose, I think it would be important that uh, the design points for the pump curve uh, matches our tank as well. So in off-peak hours, we can fill the Mirror Lake tank. Currently, these, these pumps are not designed to put water in the tank. And so uh, and we also need to evaluate the water coming in from Douglas County, the two entry points, the connections that we have, one on Highway 61 and the other one on Highway 78, and see hydraulically how that will impact them and, and uh, when we pull water from the Andy Mountain tank with a larger pump. So uh, staff recommends uh, approval to engage Keckenwood Engineering Incorporated for engineering services for upgrades to the Connor, Connors Road Booster Pump Station in the lump sum amount of $16,600. And this was a uh, budgeted item as well. Okay. Uh, council, does anyone have any questions for Pete? Uh, Pete, will they have this uh, proposal done in time for us to consider it in the next year's budget, the, whatever they're going to recommend? I would think they would, yes. Any other questions? Okay. If there are no objections, I'll place this item on the consent agenda as well. No objection. No objection. Thank you. Thank you, Pete. Okay. Moving on to D, uh, police. Uh, number one, items for auction from the police evidence room. Captain Keith Shaddix. Welcome, sir. Go ahead. 
what we have is a list of items um, that, that I believe you have attachment with that all came out of evidence room. Some of these are abandoned properties. Some were taken as evidence of crimes that mm -hmm. the, the case has been disposed of. Um, some of them we couldn't find the owners to give stuff back to. So it's a combination of a lot of the different situations that make up this list. What we're asking for is the council's uh, approval to go ahead and sell it on govdeals.com, using that as a public auction to um, dispose of it. And we do this about once a year, don't we? Yes, sir. It seems like I ran. Okay, are there any questions from council? No, it's just always interesting to read all the items. <laughs> I agree with that. Down to women's socks. I mean, there's just a lot of a lot of tools, a lot of we, pocket we went knives, through all things the evidence. like that. What you see is a small thing. There was yeah. probably out of at what come up the list, we probably put at least twenty bags in the dumpster. The stuff just throw away has no value. Yeah. So, who's responsible for listing all these items? Uh, is that the chief's job? No, sir. It's 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 my job and the evidence tech's job to go through to make sure these cases have been disposed of and it's no longer needed. That sounds very technical. I appreciate that. If there are no objections, I'll add this item to the consent agenda. No objection. None. All right. Thank you, sir. And now we will move to E Finance, Ms. Sarah Andrews. The name's been corrected here. And she would like to talk to us about cutoffs for non payment. Go ahead. Good afternoon, Council. Uh, yes, we. Um, Last time we did cutoffs for non-payment with our utility customers was the week of March 9th. Um, since then, um, we have not done any cutoffs. And I called around, um, looked at websites to see what other utility companies are doing. Um, I know, for instance, Greystone is starting June the week of June 7th. Um, Georgia Power and AGL, Atlanta Gas and Light, they were still, um, their website still said that they hadn't. It wasn't clear, it was vague as to when they'd be cutting off again. Talked to Carroll County Water Authority. They plan to start up again um, this summer. So anyway, um, as I've talked to the council in the past, um, one thing we've learned is um, we think we're helping folks by giving them extra time to pay. But what we have found is if, you know, if they can't pay one month and asking them to pay four months all at once is not going to work either. Um, so um, staff is recommending we go ahead and start cutting off June 8th, the week of that, June 8th. Um, we will work with folks. We already work with folks if they cannot pay, if they call. For instance, we do a robocall to the folks that are subject to cutoff. Um, if they can call us and let us know that they are unable to make that payment. Sometimes they say, I'm going to get paid this Friday. Can you wait till then? And we'll do a payment arrangement with them. Um, sometimes if there's a leak and it's ongoing, we'll work with folks. We ask them to pay their current bill and then maybe 50 to $100 extra on top of that so they can get their balance paid off. And so that's what I would recommend that we do. For instance, if um, folks are unable to make the full payment. Um, if you look at the cover sheet, we ran the numbers as of May 15th when this item was prepared. We had 992 customers that had a past due balance. Now, you know, that doesn't necessarily mean they're three months behind, um, but that, that those were folks that had anything past the 30-day mark. Um, 329 of those 900 customers had not made any payment since April 1st. So to me, those would be the ones that we uh, contact first, uh, let them know that they'd be subject to cutoff. And again, we will work with them, get them to um, do a payment plan if need be. So that is what we're recommending to council. Do you have any questions about that? Yeah, so you said you're going to contact them first, so they'll get a heads up. When will that be? Because you're going to, uh, it looks like we're going to start cutting off. What was the week? It was the week June. of June 8th. Typically, yeah. when we do a robocall, we'll do it maybe the Friday before that they're subject to cut off the, the following week. So okay. we would give them, you know, a few days' notice. I was kind of shocked at the number of, and, and April 1st isn't that far away. Um, are any of these abandonments? Or, or, or is it people that just, they're out of a job because of COVID 19 and, and struggling? I would say it's more likely the latter. Um, when we have an instance where if our meter reader, when they're driving through and they think that something's abandoned, um, they'll go ahead and turn the water off and leave um, a door hanger and say your water's been turned off, you know, contact if that's been an error. Um, so we try to, if we see properties that look abandoned, we try to go ahead and cut it off anyway. So I would say these are more likely people, I don't know, lost jobs or haven't been able to make a payment. 
So, like I said, we'll work with folks, um, but we don't want to get these balances so big that they can't even, you know, make a dent in those. So we're trying to avoid that. Are there any other questions from council? Mm -hmm. So this item was placed on the agenda for informational purposes only unless the council chose to do something other than what staff had had already proposed. So there is no motion here. Um, if there are no other questions, I think what we will do is just mark this item off as having been discussed and then when we adopt the agenda, we'll take it off uh, before we adopt the agenda. If there are no objections to that, we will move on to City Manager Tom Barber. F number one. I was told last time not to to say the letter and then your name. Uh, it didn't sound right, I think. So, all right, item number one, amendment to professional service agreement with Brennan Jones. Go ahead. You'll recall from <clears throat> previous discussions that we have been pursuing a development on the southwest side of town with the group that um, calls itself Winchester for the Avamore project. And in order for us to service that development, we need to build a new regional lift station for sewer. If we do not, then we're gonna have a capacity issue because that sewer flow will travel south between Charleston Place and the V-Plex over to Summergate and they'd be pumped all the way up 61 through multiple lift stations to Walmart and then go through the bottleneck under 20 and then gravity flow all the way to the West Plant and that just isn't practical. One, it's not economical, but two, we, the piping just isn't physically large enough to handle that, nor are the lift stations large enough. So what we're proposing is a new lift station in the southwest corner of the Avamore project. The issue that we have is we have to then install pipe from that point all the way to the west plant. So that means up South Van Work, over Hickory Level, which is the, the ridge line, under 20, up North Van Wert, all the way to the water plant, and then east into the West Plant for treatment. To even begin to wrap our heads around that, we need some cost estimates, and to do that, we need some survey work, and not detailed survey, but sort of if there's such a thing as back of the napkin survey, this is more what this is. This is control points at intersections and creek crossings so that we can get an idea of what the elevation changes are along that route because the elevation changes from the Avalmore project to Hickory level are severe uphill and then from Hickory level to the West Plant are also equally severe except downhill. So you've got a big climb and a big drop in this proposed sewer line. What we would recommend the council is that we have Falcon come in who has the ability to shoot the survey work using drones and to give us enough information so that Brennan can then come back and start to give us cost estimates as we move toward the day when Avamore gets <coughs> ready to break ground and we start looking at doing a tax allocation district. So that's, that's sort of the big picture of this. This is a forward-looking project by any stretch of the imagination. This is all predicated on the fact that Avamore becomes a thing. I was gonna say, how sure are we? We're not. And that was before the virus. But they continue to work on engineering and work on their financing. 
the, the downside for us is that if we don't do this, we run the very real risk of having a development take place that we cannot service, which would be irresponsible on our part. As you recall, we've talked about the need to add 500 new utility accounts each of the next five years, and a big chunk of those need to come from Avonmore. So to have that in potentially in hand and then not be able to service it, I don't even know about the legal liability of that. But So some of us are aware of a sewer line that pretty much goes nowhere and costs a lot of money and nobody is on it. Do we not run the same risk here if Avamore doesn't? Yeah, if Avamore doesn't become reality, then this surveying work would just go on the shelf. But there's no obligation to construct anything just because we do the survey. That's my point. So I appreciate that. What we are doing is preparing for the possible construction if we were to get to that phase. But in the past, construction has occurred that no one ever got on. I wanted the council to know that's not what we're looking at here. Are there any other questions for time on this item? The question I had had everything to do with what you just said, because you said it's predicated on Avamore, but we're yes. not going to construct, but we're looking at it. If they didn't happen, I'm assuming that we're still going to have to know something about what we need to do down there in the future, because if they don't happen, something else is going to eventually happen down there. The other thing to consider is that if, if Avamore doesn't take place and we don't build that lift station, then we also can't service a new industrial park in that, qu that quadrant of the city. So a whole lot of our, I don't know what analogy I'm using there, a lot of, a lot of our chips are invested in Avamore right now. We, we, need, we need that to become reality in order for that whole west side to become an annexation and development target, both residential, commercial, industrial, all the way up from the V-plex or, or even farther south, all the way up to the railroad. Okay, any other questions from council? If we have this engineering proposal in hand, more breaks ground, we can implement the proposal in a manner that would match up with Avamore's completion? I'd say no. I, I, would, I would think right now that if they move ahead at their pace and we move at our pace, that we're going to be behind anyway. It's too big of a project for us. We're talking about... Help me, Pete. Six miles. Is that right? I can't remember. Anyway, it is. So you need miles, right, right of ways, and easements, and all that other stuff to go with it. Right, which is going to be based on this. Another thing to consider is we recently, finally, cleaned out the sewer line under I twenty. So we now know that we have an intact pipe, which we have wondered about ever since I've been here. But we have no redundancy. So if anything ever happens to the pipe under 20, all of the sewer south of 20, your neighborhood, Twin Oaks, Summergate, Walmart, Wildwood, Hickory Falls, Charleston Place, all backs up in the manhole between Walmart and 20 into the most unimaginable lake you could conceive of. We would be on international news. Thank you for that highlight. I was going to say. So, this will give us redundancy on the west side of 61 that would at least give us 
a possible second route to get to the plant. So even more reasons. Are there any other questions from council? Okay. Uh, I'm, uh, if there are no objections, I'll place this item on the consent agenda. No objections. All right, let's move on to item two, uh, Tom, discussion of board application process. This is, go ahead. All right, I was approached uh, via email by council member McPherson asking to put on the agenda a discussion item specifically to take a look at comments from Cheryl Bell about our process, possible improvements, and I included uh, a copy of that email for your consideration. Okay, Councilwoman McPherson. Uh, the main things that I, I was concerned about and I had told her I thought she made some valid points about things we needed to address and that's that when people go to fill out an application or look at even the committee that they do have an idea of what does that committee and board do. Um, Uh, if it's something, here's another example, planning and zoning. If that comes at the recommendation of different council members, okay, so we all have someone we recommend, and that's the way that one works, which is different from some others, that it be stated in there that that comes at the recommendation of individual council members, and that most of the time we defer to that council member unless there's, you know, some real issue with it. Um, I also thought it would be helpful that people got acknowledgement that their application was received, you know, that, would it, that it would be reviewed, and, and it, it would be good to have follow-up to say, this person was nominated, your application will stay in the folder electronically, whatever, for the next six months, it expires or whatever. You'll need to do a new one next year if you want to have an application to be considered for these different boards. Just something that kind of cleans it up, makes it a little easier for people to understand before they apply for something, the process, so they'll know what to do. You know, there's no sense in putting in their, you know, application if they know for sure they're not going to be considered by a council person. But even that's not set in stone because we don't actually require that they come from our ward. But if it were me and it had to come from my ward, that would be a big deal. You know, somebody that lives in another ward would know, well, I won't put in an application for that open spot. So just something to clean it up, make it a little easier for people to apply and to get some feedback. You know, that thank you, your application has been received, you know, we may not have any openings, but if that's a decision that's going to be made, we have no openings right now or whatever, I, I'm not sure what else we need to do, but we need to look at it. I think those are three very uh, good and valid points, and that can all be done administratively, and it mm -hmm. probably needs to occur with Tom meeting with department heads to come up with uh, some way to incorporate those three criteria into the form uh, and then redo the form, and I know Alyssa handles most of that, but that's going to be sort of an internal process. But does anybody else have any discussion on this? I, I think the requirement, I'm not objecting to anything that Leslie said, but I think some of the requirements change periodically. On Downtown Development Authority, when we put Matthew on there, when Matthew was selected before he became council member, I thought it was great that we had some with legal knowledge on that particular board because of the powers invested in that board. And the fact that we've got Carl Peabody on it, finance expert, tax expert on that, you know, it lends expertise to that board that other people didn't have. Uh, people needed to be business owners, have a business interest in downtown, but they brought something special to the table. Now, if one of the current members were to, to leave, we may, we may decide that we want something different than what that member represented. We, we may want a commercial real estate person because we'd like down, the Downtown Development Authority to, to acquire commercial real estate for the city. The same thing with the, the Bill Record Development Authority, which is a vacant spot. I'd like to see either a commercial banker, a commercial real estate expert, 
for somebody that's run a, a large distribution industrial site on it that, that would have some, bring it to the table that kind of knowledge, but it's going to change from, from person to person. Um, so I, I don't know how you're going to specify that other than, you know, if you're interested, throw your name out there, contact your, your um, city council member, go to the boards that those boards or uh, meetings are published, go and sit in and see if it's what you're interested in. You know, I joined Parks and Rec because my granddaughters were playing soccer and I, I wanted it to be a great experience for them. So whatever I could do, I, not that I brought a lot of experience to Parks and Rec, but I had, a, I had something to bring. <coughs> um, Excuse me. I really enjoyed working on downtown, on the, the Main Street board. That didn't require any special knowledge, but, but it required some passion and, and time. Uh, so there, if people just go to these meetings and look, I think, the, I think the world will open up for them. Well, and keep in mind, Councilwoman McPherson didn't talk about any qualifications, and I think that's important to highlight here for that very reason. Each time an application uh, is received and a vacancy exists on a board, that board and whomever the appointing authority is looks at the total composition of the current board and then looks at the applications and determines from that, I think, which one probably fits. For example, like you're talking about, if an attorney came off of a board and you wanted an attorney on the board, you might be looking for an attorney in the, applica in the applications, but you wouldn't necessarily put that out as a qualification in the general form that is sent out by the city clerk. So I think that's a, a road that I had wanted to avoid going down, and you, you point that out uh, very well. Mr. Moptan? I would just add... Is this working? I would just add also maybe my recollection of the application, it does not say that the board will be making a recommendation to city council, so maybe that should be clarified. I don't know if that's true for all the boards, but I know on Main Street and uh, VRDA and DDA, I think each one of those boards make their recommendation to the council. Now, we don't all, we don't, we're not binded by that recommendation, but it should be pointed out that those applicants may, they might, might, that might trigger them to then go and go to the, meet with those board members and get to know them and, and, um, clarify their, what they can bring to it, so. That Feels like a common theme to that would be applicants should not only put in an application, but should show up to those board meetings. Right, uh, yeah. Anybody else? Well, and that's part of the reason I didn't address the part about qualifications, because that would really be hard to put into writing. Um, one thing I did miss was um, if it does, because this was in the email, and I thought, okay, we should look at this. Uh, it talked about if it refers to an ordinance or something like that. And David, you can probably help us on that. If it refers to something, they need to know what that is or where that is or what it says. Do you have anything to add, David? No, I think that's a good idea. Okay, so uh, any other council members have a comment? Oh, one other thing, sorry. And that's just- That's that three. It's, <laughs> I know. it's kind of reiterating what you guys said, but I think it's so important because when you do apply for something, you will have a pretty good idea of what they do if you actually do attend their meetings. I also think you'd be have a better opportunity of getting on a board or knowing that you don't want anything to do with the board or the committee when you find out what they do. And so uh, it's kind of like doing your student teaching in college. It kind of gives you an idea of, do I really want to be in that classroom or not? Um, come to those meetings, get familiar with it, and, uh, and then you'll have a really good idea of, you know, what, what they are doing, maybe the types of, because of the type of decisions they make and what they handle, what you have to bring to the table. That's it. Okay, sorry about that. Okay. Last uh, one. Yes, sir. Go yeah, ahead. The point was, I do think that uh, the people that do apply, should be notified if they do not get the position. They shouldn't be left hanging so they don't know what happened. I think that's a valid point, and, and we'll ask Tom to make that part of uh, his discussion with staff, but I don't know exactly how you do that because what happens is when an applicant applies, sometimes they don't just apply to one board. Sometimes they apply to all boards or any boards, and in that case, my understanding is the city clerk sends that application to all uh, department heads and then they upload it into our system so that we can also see it so I don't know 
maybe y'all can work on a way to do it, but it seems difficult to me for the city clerk to c continually follow up on this application all through the chain of department heads. But let's let staff work on some sort of a plan and, and bring it back if that's okay with everybody. Sure. Any other comments? Okay, let's move on. We only have about 15 minutes left in the work session. Uh, so that was a discussion only item. I'll cross that off. Let's move to item number three, Carroll County Road Construction Proposal, Daniel Road. Mr. Barber. We table this item to tonight and um, one of the things that we discussed, I believe last time, was the receptivity that the property owners along Daniel Road had to annexation. That has turned out to not be, uh, we, we didn't get a great response there. We also have determined that we do not have any water supply on the gravel part of Daniel Road. There's a fire hydrant at the end of the paved portion of the road and that's as far south as we go. What we do have down there is a two inch water line that runs from Augusta Woods eastward to the lift station that we use just to clean the lift station with that runs under the road, but there's no water service. So there's no, there's no opportunity right now to dangle a carrot to the property owners that there would be more to city uh, annexation than just police protection. But the fact that there's no water there means that that, that would be a possibility in the future, that we could run a, a water line there and offer water to those property owners. So my recommendation is that we, some, that someone make a motion to postpone this decision until and if we get the adjacent owners to agree. My recommendation to you is that we do not participate in paving that road until we've annexed both sides of the road. Okay, council, let's open this up for discussion because this has been going on for probably, well, I've been told <coughs> it's been going on for more than a year, but I've been involved for probably a couple of months. So let's have a, a discussion about it. But let me just clarify one thing that Tom said, and that is that I have been under the impression, uh, either because I was told directly or left with the information to believe that we had a water line that ran down the length of that road even the gravel part, whether it ran through the center or whether it ran along the side. We are now aware from our water guy that there is a single two inch line that crosses the road only. Okay, go ahead, anybody? My, my only question would be, I mean, is, would this be something the city is gonna pursue actively at this time? Because I don't wanna postpone it indefinitely. I would like to say, you know, can we postpone it for 12 months to get a status update? if we're gonna be actively pursuing getting a water line down there or providing other services in that area. Um, I just don't want it to be forgotten about if it's something that we, we want to pursue. Yeah, it, it, it didn't sound to me like there was disinterest in being annexed. There was disinterest in paying property taxes. Yeah, so if we're willing to annex them without making them pay property taxes, they're all in, I think. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Yeah, because that, so, that was the thing that they were saying, that it wasn't about other stuff. It was just the fact that if they had to pay county yes. tax and city taxes, too, it was a no. Okay. They were okay so until they asked overcome. that question. And that was when I gave them the answer that they would have to be paying county taxes and city taxes. Then they hurry up and said no. Because one of them was saying yes, but then after that, that was a no. So if you can convince them that both the taxes, then you might have a chance. But other than that, I don't see it. It might be, but I don't see it. So all we have to do now is convince them right. to pay taxes and a water tap. <laughs> well, and they can have water service and police protection. Uh, there the, is the subdivision of South Reed Road, that's inside the city, is that correct? It, I mean, there's a subdivision on Reed Road. Augusta Woods, right? Yeah, that's yeah. yeah my subdivision. Where's that water coming from? From them? From the west. 
Coming in from the west side. Comes in from the west side. I'm not sure how we do it indefinite, other than indefinitely right now, okay. because we've got people that don't want to be annexed in, and we don't have, from what I can gather from what we know now, which this is a little frustrating because it seems the information seems to change, and then we finally get the facts. And I'm not blaming. I'm not blaming anybody. It's because there's just, you know, sometimes people think things are a certain way and they aren't. It doesn't seem that we have a vested interest to pave it. We don't not have right that area. We have people who don't want to be in the city in that area. And we don't know when people will live there that want to be annexed. They and own we don't water to now. You know, they don't have running water, no way. Because I know two of them, I definitely know they're on well water. Yeah. So until so, we have know. people there that want city water and city services, what are we going to do? Because none of us see a, none of us are going to force people. Okay. But the question I, I think that Councilman Montahan's bringing up is, is it the direction of the council that staff pers actively pursue selling annexation to these folks? Right, exactly. That's my question. Well, not not to muddy this up too much, and we do we, we are short on time. But the original uh, discussion by the council in 2007 was that the city would enter into an agreement with the county, a long-term maintenance agreement, and in exchange for that, the city would partner with the county and pave the road. There may be benefits to the city to having that road paved, and it may be such that we can enter into such an agreement. Does the council want to either pursue the annexations, which would justify the paving, or, or even simultaneously uh, pursue a discussion with the county about the agreement to, to partner on the paving and a long-term maintenance agreement, which is what was originally contemplated in 2007. But wasn't there also in those minutes something about the Augusta Woods developer paving? Having there was, but that's long gone and over Right, with. it's gone, which means in the minutes that you're quoting, though, it was actually going to get, at least a portion was going to get paved by a developer, and that's not going to happen. Or they were going to do something. Yeah. Well, those facts have changed because that does Right, so that could have been part of the reason why the city was more willing to enter into that agreement with the county was that it, w it didn't sound to me like the city was either wasn't paving at all or was doing a much smaller area or something based on those minutes. Okay. And Does, David said last meeting that an adversarial annexation probably is a, not a non-starter. Yeah, who wants to do that? Right, we're not interested in that. I, I, I would think problem. that we table so, it until yeah. they come back and ask us. Yeah, and that's exactly what I was going to say. So essentially and definitely in this case means when when the property owners come to, to the city at this point. For what Unless you all tell us to go chase it, then we'll go chase it. Well, you tell me a reason we would chase it, and when I hear a really good reason, I mean, I haven't heard one. Have no, you, you don't have time for that. So is, <laughs> is there going to be a really good reason? No, because that's not your recommendation. Well, so the, the, just the safety of the road, I think, is where all this started. That, that's what the county really wants to get opposed, but they don't feel like they can do it. So. All right, so my understanding is that the, the idea that we had a, line, a water line along the road came from our conversation with the county. When, when we tell them that there is no water line, then maybe they reconsider whether they will widen the road to their specs and pave it themselves. Okay. Well, under that, I would assume that uh, the council would be okay with the uh, the uh, suggested motion by the by staff, which is to postpone it indefinitely. Is, is that correct? Any objection? I'm gonna place it on the consent agenda. I just got one question. All right, go ahead. That section, the uh, gravel section of um, Daniel Road, is that in the city limits? Mm -hmm. It's outside the city mm -hmm. limits. Okay. Now, if it was in the city limits, we wouldn't be having this discussion. Uh, I figured as much. Okay, that item is on the consent agenda. Uh, last item, Tom, is uh, fall recreational programming. We've got about six minutes. Do you just want to take this over to regular session? or We can talk about it for a minute. All right, let's go just for a couple of minutes.
Go. Okay. We canceled everything for the spring. We refunded everything, and then we started canceling everything for the summer, and you can see the list. So now the question is, when we get out the crystal ball and we polish it up and we look ahead into the fall, what do we see? I see a, a, an M, um, an unpredictable future to the governor's executive orders. I haven't been any good at predicting what he was going to do, and I don't think I'm any better now. I know that Carroll County Schools is putting together multiple start date plans because they know they don't know. Um, I haven't talked to Douglas County Schools. I don't know what they're doing, but we did just get some action from the Georgia uh, High School Association allowing high schools to begin conditioning only and with, with pretty good restrictions. So the question that we are facing because of the need for there to be registration time and practice creation of teams and scheduling and all that stuff that happens before the season is that at some point early in the summer we're going to run out of time to have a fall program <coughs> we're not there but you know we're, we're getting ready to skip june meetings so the next time we get together is july 14th i think or something so I felt like we needed to talk at least once in light of what the Georgia High School uh, Association has released to get your feelings about where you think we're headed. What does your crystal ball say? Are we going to have public school in August? Are we going to have public school in September? Maybe January? If it's January, then there's no fall sports, probably. And if there's no fall high school sports, I would say that we have no fall recreational program. So to me, the trigger to all of our decisions is a hard announcement from Carroll and Douglas schools. That's, to me, what we're waiting on that would be paralleled with decisions by the high school association about sports because I don't I don't I'm not going to stand here and say that I see that we'll have high school sports without high school right if so anyway all right I'm going to cut you off right there and that's a good intro to that this item is for discussion only guys we're going to have to adjourn this work session so that we can start the regular session on time you so adjourn. I'm going to go ahead and adjourn this meeting, and uh, if you'll cut off the, and we'll take a small break before we come back.